So probably one of the most common questions, particularly from new players, but it also comes from, from those who've been in the game for a while, uh, is what do I do when it comes to the economy? And I and others have kind of thrown bits and pieces at them. I've, I've done stuff on kind of fertility and, and building buildings and uh, offered some financial advice and all, all that other stuff. But <laughs> it's just, uh, th those are at, at best partial answers and they don't really provide answers to, to the question about how players ought to, ought to proceed. So what I've done in this series of tests, there's there's no real tutorial here, although you could read it that way. Uh, if you go with the policies I'm going to talk about, uh, I, I've taken a little bit more systemic approach or systematic approach to uh, evaluating the, the better and worse courses of, of action when it comes to the economy. And I, I'd like to start off with just kind of what the, the big takeaway is. To my surprise, it is spamming this thing down here, trade deals. Now, this is all being done from a union, basically a 61 campaign. It's heavily modified. Uh, I think, if anything, the mod tends to understate the, the power of this. This was a, a test I almost did not do. And uh, it turns out that spamming trade deals, along with taking the Tariff Act, which allows you to take up to 50% tariffs, uh, this is the union in, 18, you can see, spring of 1864, so 36 months in, and we it's a half billion dollars annually just, just in tariffs. And so uh, I'll, I'll show you what, what to compare it to, but if you needed nothing else, I, I would say go ahead and, and spam trade deals. That was particular to this test, and then there are just three policies, two of which I think apply to everyone. One might just apply to this modified campaign, but everyone with your eco subsidies improved credit rating, I think, is is probably the best bang for the buck. And uh, might talk a little bit more about why that is in this video, but it's really not the subject. And the other one is logistics reforms. At least take some of it in this modified campaign. These cost twice as much as vanilla starting out, so I wasn't able to take them that much, and they still work. And the trade deal costs the same as vanilla, but I had modified it before the test to only take one half as much. Uh, I think it improves trade by 5% each, and so in this one it does it by 2.5%. And by far, it's still the best result. And why I say it's the best result? Well, that is what you are looking at right here. So... I did a number of tests, skip this one and on to this one, and played them through 36 months each, and this is the recorded debt at the end of the campaign. This is the recorded debt that I actually took on during the campaign, so it subtracts out the debt you start with, again, as the union in early 61, and this, I think, is the most accurate test of the kind of efficacy of, of different economic paths. Uh, these are works in progress. These are all just isolating one way you can try to advance, and I haven't really done too much of the interaction. So what would happen when I say I combine the, the two best from the debt perspective, maybe trade and agricultural subsidies? I don't know. I haven't got to those tests yet. So this is a, a developing works in progress. But this also shows that... Uh, even when you play the campaign very similarly, and, and I played as Union, I played Big Navy, 300,000 plus troops by April 1864, generally winning the, the, the campaign, even if I was auto-resolving almost all the battles, and taking the same three projects, propaganda, improved credit rating, and uh, the logistics reforms, that there, there are differences in outcomes, and trade deals along with, I think I took one or two takes of the uh, trade warfare project. It, it just doesn't have a close second. So <clears throat> anyways, that's how I structured these tests. So I was able to control for a lot of things, army size, navy size, general progress of the war, uh, policy in act order, and the policies and act I took were almost identical. The only real differences were when I decided to go a little bit harder in the paint for some of the policies that would enable subsidies when I needed those, uh, and then taking the subsidies themselves and plugging them into different projects. 
All right, so the way that I'm going to unfold the, the rest of this video, I mean, if you're just here for the, the kind of quick and dirty, I mean, that was five minutes. It still wasn't that quick or, or dirty, but that was the basic takeaway. Um, I, you may or may not need propaganda if you're going to play on vanilla, but definitely would take improved credit rating, definitely would take the logistics reform, and I would spam trade deals as much as you can. And you can go big, you can go wide on the, on the seas and on land, and you, as long as you do well in battles, you you should not should not have too much of a problem. Uh, there are those who may say, you know, debt isn't the best way to analyze uh, different economic pathways. And, and that's fine. I just don't have a better one. And what I tried to do is, and, and I have done this, I, I've gone into, I think there are 38 different goods, and I've compared what I got in the last 12 months of these 36-month playthroughs. And there's some interesting stuff in there. There's some other stuff that doesn't really matter uh, as, as much and doesn't seem to change, but that, that that's also interesting. Uh the reason why I think debt is, is probably the, the most accurate measure of different development paths is because it takes into account both what you spend and then what you get back from it. As a player in this game, unless you've got some kind of interesting mini game that you're working on, it doesn't matter to you what happens to businesses, if they're profitable, if they're not. Uh, as long as people's wealth is high enough, it's not affecting your national morale. And in vanilla, it's probably not that, that big of a deal. It, it doesn't really matter to you. And so what you are dealt with, or the situation the game gives you to, to deal with, is you can keep spending and rack up debt, and it's only the credit rating stop that is kind of your, your limit. And so uh, improving the credit rating is definitely one of those, I think, long-term solutions. Uh, and to a company that you also can try to cut costs and bring in revenue to make you take on less debt. That's all you really have to deal with that as the player. And so in terms of what players need and also the, the most complete test of these different economic pathways, I think debt from the time you take on managing the economy is is the, the most accurate measure we have right now. But at the very end of this, I'll go through some of these uh, resources and just show you kind of some of the weird stuff that happened in there. Uh, some explanation like is, is why. Why is trade deal like it, it appears heads and shoulders above everything else. Remember, it's trade deals plus I maxed out the most of the taxes that I could. So if we go in to our policy tree here, I didn't do everything. And this actually is the, the end of the trade deals playthrough. Uh, tariff Act, that was pretty easy to do. Uh, we went for this, we went for Revenue Act, Revenue Act, Confiscation. Confiscation, I also realized, it, it, it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's pretty good, but it, there is a caveat. It doesn't reduce, it doesn't increase supply efficiency of Union armies in Union territory. It only does it basically when you're in CSA territory. But, but anyways, Bank Act and Revenue Act 3. I avoided war bonds. Uh, and both of the, the, the printing notes. Uh, but I think that's that's worth mentioning there. And so what we ended up having, and you can see it here. So, logis well, that's logistics reform. Yeah, trade warfare. So in the end, we're getting 32.5%, whatever more lucrative trade deals means. And we're also doing that here with our finances. Everything is taxed as much as I can can get it. Uh, it's one of the other kind of shortcomings of this game, which is that it doesn't model shortages very well. It tries to do it. I think it still tries to do it for weapons purchases, but even then it doesn't do a great job. And you don't have to deal with the long-term negative effects of, of having tax rates that are this high. And you know where the game starts, and so they are kind of abnormally, abnormally high. But you don't have to deal with any of that. You just have to deal with the the fiscal problem. So if you don't really, if you're not interested in the economy, that's that's fine because it's not that hard of a, of a of a problem to deal with. And so that is how you can kind of use this video as a as a tutorial. You can keep it simple and, and focus on the the military stuff. And on the policy side, these are not the three best economic policies the union can start with. You can see I've modded other things to open up more policies, but I, I consciously chose three that I thought wouldn't 
really affect the economic outcome. And I also gave the CSA in all of these tests to play against the, the kind of, I think, arguably three of the best policies for them. Uh, I do have something to say about uh, these starting policies. And the takeaway is nothing new, but I did not understand how ridiculously undercosted industrialization is. And, and arguably the, the railroad policy is really undercosted. And so if you don't really care about the politics, but you just want to want the economy to do well enough, you want to take industrialization. I think either the railroads, uh, depending if you're union, probably your CSA, but we're focused on the union here. So that's Union Pacific. And then I would say breadbasket as, as the third for uh, reasons I'll talk about at the end. But these are the, the policies I used in all those tests. All right, so the what, what the test means, the baseline test, it's kind of exactly what you would think it is. Uh, I didn't build any buildings. I just went for those three projects, propaganda, credit reform, and logistics reform. And then I just, I fought the war. <laughs> I So this was my second to last test. This is my last test. I was really concerned when I got up to this point, that, and I kind of felt like this might happen before, that there was basically no difference. I mean, I understand that 525 to 825, that, that, that's actually a fairly big spread. Uh, all right, fine. But the other ones are, are pretty normal. And, and I was really like, you got to be kidding me. The, the, the best policy 36 months in is to basically do nothing. But of course, that it's not exactly the, the the case. And then, you know, I was kind of shocked that agricultural buildings. I spent just spoiler alert. I spent about a hundred million dollars on agricultural buildings in the summer of '61. Uh, some of that was on mills. Some of that was on uh, a lot of that was on just upgrading farms. I'll say that on my mod, I've gotten rid of the subsidy skew, which is not something you can do in vanilla. I, I, I don't like it don't think it makes sense and so I would say that probably the buildings which would mean the agricultural buildings the industrial buildings and part of the infrastructure test which are by the way uh, two of those are two of the worst performing already they're they're gonna perform even worse in vanilla and so I think one of my recommendations is don't take don't build buildings uh, because the evidence is with the subsidy skew gone, in game, either you pay with it with the subsidy or you pay two or three times as much with just regular cash. And these tests got rid of that two or three X penalty that the game imposes for, for just paying cash. Uh, those buildings don't seem with that gone to be very good bargains. The agricultural building performed slightly worse than the subsidies. Uh, all of these tests also had about 75 to $100 million in prison camps built because I didn't want the CSA getting any support buff from overcrowded prisons. So if you're not going to build that, you can also subtract out that debt as well. And, and if you were to do that, the relative advantage of trade deals stands out even more because then you'd probably be looking at maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty million in debt, which would be if you took hundred and fifty out of say agricultural buildings, that would still be four hundred and fifty million. And so then the trade deals would have been oh my goodness, three about three times a better deal than the agricultural buildings. And I would say the only there isn't really a huge difference in spending between those two. I don't think 13 takes of trade deals. I don't know what the average if if it was eight or ten million dollars a take. It starts out really low. I think about five five million two and a half million. Whatever it is, I, I wouldn't imagine that we spent more on the trade deals throughout the entire 36 months than we did just on the 100 million of agricultural buildings in the summer of '61, and we got. Again, many, many multiples, the benefit and agricultural buildings was, was a pretty good one. Uh, all right, that's the baseline. The industrial subsidy, it was just like the baseline. The only difference was I took industrial subsidies in this playthrough and I spent them on the subsidized industry project repeatedly, uh, spammed it and 
you know, that's that's that. Industrial buildings was kind of like the agricultural buildings. I, I, I spent, uh, again, a, this is actually a lot more. This is probably about $150, $200 million in 61, just upgrading a bunch of mines, uh, building, but mostly upgrading the, the few furnaces that the union has, and also upgrading the ironworks that are found throughout the, the union. And, uh, yeah, that one, you have to kind of discount this one because this is actually an old campaign in which I didn't raise any taxes. And I've done some of the math retrospectively, and I think this actually would have been a really decent performer. So these are the ones I'd, I'd say concentrate the most on. And uh, that spending on buildings just never paid for itself relative to the other options. So, <clears throat> but anyways, that's that's what I spent on. I did not spend on factories, uh, which would have been, you know, one of the other angles I could go. I didn't go for port upgrades. Right? There are so many things actually in this game you could spend money on and, and, and evaluate. Uh, but that's not what I did. It was really on the mining and uh, iron and steel and, and all that that good stuff. Infrastructure build was kind of the, the wildest build. Uh, here, again, I had to build railroads because I didn't get any. to, to start, you know I wasn't gifted what industrialization or Northern Pacific gives you. Uh, so I built a lot of railroads. Again, I didn't have the subsidy skew. So it was just just building with normal money. I used the financial, what is it, the eco subsidies to take the uh, improved markets project as well as the improved credit. Uh, built nine markets that cost about $25 million. Uh, when it came to industrial subsidy spending, those were spent on the Improve IIP project. Took that repeatedly. I would say overall, uh, by the time it ended 36 months in, I, I probably got about a half dozen railroad lines constructed. And just roughly estimating it, it was at least, I'd say, $10 million a line. And I'll, I'll save my, my spiel on how overpowered industrialization is for its cost, but that should just give you some sense uh, as to what was going on. So IIP project, industrial subsidies, uh, eco-subsidies were split for credit rating and improving markets, built a number of markets, built a number of railroads. I, and I was, I was really, I thought this one was going to do better. I, I, I did, but I might have... Whatever, that, that is what it is. Agriculture subsidy was really easy. It's basically the baseline test or the industrial subsidy test. But instead of industrial subsidies and subsidizing industry, we did agricultural subsidies. And we uh, sub did the, usually it was the subsidized agriculture project. I also think I took a couple takes of the mechanized agriculture because I needed some some troops later on. Uh, and, and to my surprise, I thought that was probably going to be the weaker one. And it actually turned out to be one of the, the, the best ones. Agriculture buildings, I've already explained, and, and trade deals is, is uh, fairly fairly straightforward. Uh, well, I've, I've already covered it. Uh, all right, those are the tests. And again, this was just a, this is kind of the last full campaign where I was just like, economic nationalism, but try to keep taxes low. For, for role-playing reasons, I was not optimizing it for, for finances. Uh, observations from, from all these, these tests. Uh, probably not a surprise, but when you do well on the battlefield, you generally have better finances. And for these tests, for the first 12 months, I really, I, I moved armies around but I, I was more interested in just getting through these quickly. I really didn't pay that much attention. I, I didn't even give the, the fleet's blockade stance, so they weren't accumulating any perks. So I think these actually perform slightly better because when you give your fleet's perks, they can take supply colliers and they'll use fewer supplies and other things. So I think that probably the spread between these two and uh, these five up here is a little bit narrower, but I think there is a real spread 
particularly when it comes to the um, trade deals project and high tariffs. So in these two, I, I only fought one battle, and that was by accident. And I think it was in this, this playthrough. It didn't, didn't really matter. But I, I paid a lot more attention to where I was moving armies. I was really uh, attentive to putting armies in stances so they would collect XP and really tried to put armies in positions that the auto-resolve battles would, would go our way. And I would say that we, we won well more than half of them on, on auto-resolve. It, it just seemed like doing that for 36 months rather than doing it for the last 24 months generally had a positive effect on the finances. I mean, when you lose major battles, you lose supplies. Supplies are expensive. I have, I have stuff to, to, to show you now on on uh, <laughs> just this weird thing with provisions. All right, here we are. And if you haven't seen it, they, they added a new tooltip, which is really, really good. I like this. It's this little green bar with the kind of lines across it. And it tells you what the local supply capacity is. And that's cool. And we should, should click this to supply, even if it doesn't doesn't really matter. Uh, but anyways, if you can get local supply, that, that, that can frequently be good. But not always. Now down here in and around DC, this is our level 2 supply depot. This has, okay, this has 5,000 provisions, which that's, that's, yeah, it's quite good. I don't think in here, right, it'll tell us that we have provisions coming from Annapolis, but I don't know that it actually tells us how much those provisions cost. And, and if you try to connect imports and, and exports and follow them from IAP to IAP, it doesn't work. I have tried this, and it, it is in the manual that there are, visible IIPs in this game and there are invisible IIPs in this game. And so if you try to trace like the path of where's this coal coming from and where's it going, well more than half the time if I go back to this IIP it doesn't report say selling coal to Annapolis but but somehow it gets there. Anyways, here let's see if we can... Okay, so this is telling us our, our supply ratio. Now I gotta keep the mouse here. Um, trying to get to the cost of supply. It's a little hard. It's a little hard to see. The overall average, I think, is a couple hundred dollars, four hundred, five hundred dollars, something like that. Oh, it's three hundred. Uh, in this playthrough, I think it's the lowest of, of all of them, so it's three hundred dollars. Remember, that's the average, but that can be really misleading for what it actually costs your troops to supply. Now, these armies are all pretty good, so I'm not seeing where they indicate how much their supplies cost, which is really unfortunate. But not the end of the. No, they're not going to tell us. Let's see if we click off supply. If we find out anything from here. Hmm. So when I was playing this before, it would show me the cost of the supplies that we were, were buying locally. And look, what happened in that, just so you understand. You see provisions there, and usually it would be local supply and that would be the majority of what we were using, the overwhelming majority. And they were low in supply. And so it would cost about $500 of provision. Yet, up here in New England, provisions, now if you can see, it's the third line from the bottom there. Provisions are $5.60. So it was 100 times more expensive for troops basically in this box from, I don't know, Baltimore, Washington, Alexandria, over to Winchester, and up to Frederick. So if you think about that box there, almost all of those armies were being supplied with $500 provisions. Now, this is spring, and so I, th I think there's a lull in the fighting, and they probably rebuilt their stocks over the winter. But when armies actually get 
moving and they run through their supplies and all that other stuff, basically local provisions are going to cost $500, $550. You'll see that the supply, the local supply ratio will be like 3% and it will tell you you're paying out the nose. It just seems really odd to me that I think provisions can only be consumed by military forces. I don't think that I don't think civilians can purchase provisions. And so it, it seemed odd to me that a lot of these factors for the entire 36 months were reporting low prices for provisions. I don't know if it continues through here. So here you can see they get to $28 by the time they go from right the the sound coast here in Connecticut to Trenton, New Jersey, they're up to 28. And I don't know that we get to too many more factories before we hop over into Maryland. Do we get a sense here? Here the provisions are down to 23, but somewhere between here and here, the prices were jumping from $23 to over 500. And I think they were buying it locally. It, it just seems strange to me that the game doesn't model the fact that their government produced goods. Government is the buyer. And my goodness, there's a rail line that runs. You would think the government would buy from here, raise the prices here, bring them to troops here, and they would have a lower cost of production, maybe around the or a lower cost of consumption. And maybe they'd be paying the actual provision price. Plus, there are tons of ports here that were unblocked and they could have gotten it here. It, it just seems strange that the armies usually are paying just ridiculously high prices. And that's why you got to be wary of the average and assuming that the average price is actually the price of the provisions that you're consuming. All right, that was that was very long-winded, but uh, it was one of those interesting, interesting finds. I thought I would not recommend uh, having the AI do your weapons purchases. It was something else I found out, and I, I left. I was in the first test, and I, I just had to turn it off. I, I couldn't take it anymore. The, there are things you can tweak on it and, it, and you can make it better, but... Uh, I would say manage it yourself. That would be my best bet. Your best bet. Other observations here. These revenue raising acts, the Tariff Act, eh, I don't know about, yeah, confiscation to a degree, Revenue Act, one, two, three, and Bank Act, these are all, like industrialization, the pre-war policy, these are seriously undercosted. Uh, what the union can get for raising its maximum tariffs from 30 to 50 percent, again, think about what that means here. Basically, that's a gain, right? This is easy math. It's a gain of $200 million annually at this point. And what you're paying for that is, oh my goodness, negative 10 relations with the Europeans. So this is one of the ways you can think about it. Uh, how could I buy back better relations with the Europeans? Send envoys, cost two and a half million, I think for 5%. So for basically $5 million, you could buy back the relations that are gonna give you, again, in this playthrough, at this point in the war, about $200 million annually. Why would you not do that? It's so easy to buy that back. Confiscation, um, it, the, the same principle applies. So, you know, assuming that you're attacking into the CSA, you're basically reducing your supply cost by 15%, basically. Uh, three support annually. So I'm not going to show you probably the right one. Let's see, what is this one? You know, further reduce enemy support in loyal states. No. This might be the, the, the one occupied. This kind of, if you conquer those states, what you would get back. But even if you take the more expensive one, at least in my mind, now this is after eight takes of it, but I think this started mm, at much less. I think maybe five million was the vanilla cost, or the the cost I put in, but it's for plus two propaganda. And anyways, whatever it is, it's going to cost you less than 10 million annually. So if you do it for three years, maybe 30 million max, 
but to reduce your army upkeep costs, now this is after I've already reduced my army upkeep costs, but 15% of that is, oh boy, uh, about 40 million, 45 million annually. Again, why would you not? And, and it's actually much more because the army upkeep cost has already been brought down by, by taking that project. So again, that's really under costed. Revenue act here. So you're gonna lose negative one support and you get to take that 5% tax. Uh, that's the income tax. Income tax is 359 million. Down here, it's 15%. So take a third of that. So you get 100 million plus in income taxes. And all you gotta do is buy back one support, I think once, which is like less than 5 million. Less than 5 million once for 100 million plus annually? Of course. Again, it's really, really under costed. And I am kind of making the same point, but I'm, I'm not going to do it in as great a detail. This is just a one time loss of support minus two, support minus three, uh, support negative three. That's only one time. And the thing about the bank is you get 120 million per year and you get that free credit rating boost of plus two. That's the same boost as one take of improved credit rating, which I think in vanilla is five million. And so it 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 that credit boost almost buys back the support loss if you were gonna go and, and then take propaganda. So hopefully that's a, a one framework you could use to evaluate what what matters. I think I'm gonna end here on a, a slight a slight rant about how good industrialization is. Now, I, I've modded <laughs> so much in, in these campaigns that I don't even remember what vanilla is. I think vanilla is, you take industrialization and I think it's either 2.5 or maybe it's actually the negative five national morale reduction. Uh, what you get for that are a large number of railroads and here we, we don't have them, but most of these would be built. I should see what the costs are. Why is this not? Okay, so this would be 15 million. Again, this is about subsidy skew. Six, four, that's 19 million, 11 million, right? When you take this, you get a number of these built. It's 12 million. So yeah, I, I guess it's about 10 million or so on, on average. And they're built at the very beginning of the campaign. So all of the troop movement bonuses, all of the economic bonuses that you get from railroads are done. Plus you don't have to pay the cost. I would say conservatively, it, it's got to be more than $50 million in benefit right off the bat. That's just in cost you don't have to pay. Never mind then all the other positive economic effects uh, and military effects of, of that. Remember that industrialization also gives you that 20% manpower bonus. That also has a cost to it. Uh, you can't rely on what I've done here because I realize how under-costed this is in vanilla. I think this is a million bucks for 5% manpower. I, I raised it to 4 million in mine. So in vanilla, four takes of that would be probably close to $5 million dollars on top of the, the benefits of railroads. Uh, I believe also, I don't know if it's Southern and Northern industrialization uh, or just Southern, but several of the industries will start with one additional upgrade level. Well, if you've ever looked to upgrade, and I might've, well, not, not in this playthrough, I won't have upgraded them, but if you've ever upgraded, uh, where are we here? Mills, lumber mills, ironworks. Oh, and okay, apparently we, we do have some. So if you were upgrade level one to level two, that would be 1.3 million. And again, you have to do it with a subsidy skew in game and being throttled by the, the policy. So I, I wouldn't want to do that. Uh, and I think it applies to, to everything. It gets that extra upgrade level. So it's really hard for me to put an exact figure on it. I think the probable benefit 
of taking industrialization as a starting policy, it's probably about $100 million, like easily. And, and the longer the campaign goes on, arguably the more important the, the benefit because the economic benefits of railroads just will compound the longer the, the campaign goes on. And if your industry is upgraded a level, that's fine. Also, remember with industrialization, you get access to the third and, and fourth levels. As a union, uh, this, this is not that important to me because all it does is open the door for more subsidies. Uh, what I want to do, and I'll get off my industrialization is overpowered rant, uh, it is my next, we're going to start a new campaign here. Campaign nine is, is going to start soon, and I'm going to put the, the hypothesis to the test. And what we're going to do is we're going to go with breadbasket industrialization and uh, Union Pacific. And what I like is we got to get industry up to level two so that we can do northern routes. Uh, but I'm going to go hard in the paint for trade deals. We're going to use the, just to, uh, let's see here. For the, yeah, diplomatic subsidies, we're going to do trade deals. For the eco subsidies, which we'll be maxing out, we've got to do improved credit rating. Certainly. Uh, politics is going to be for propaganda. Military subsidies are going to be for logistics reforms. And then the industrialization subsidies, whatever we're able to get, I think we're just going to plow right into infrastructure reform. And, and so there is a use for it. But the reason why I would go breadbasket is, well, you get this. And remember, the, the number of volunteers in Midwest states being down minus 10%, you can buy that back by just taking the recruitment offices twice. And so if you're playing vanilla, that's really easy. But the other reason you do it is because now with Breadbasket, you get to level three. So what? Well, we're maxing out tariffs. We're growing trade. We're going to do it with the much better domestic, I think, economic stuff. And what you get... Relations plus 10 with Europe, I don't care about that. Trade potential with Europe, though, plus 25%. That's huge. Land sales income down 50%. Who cares? Right? 5 million? Who cares? Uh, I will say that the... Oops. That basically this policy here, trade potential with Europe plus 25%. Remember, 13 takes of trade deals was 32.5 in my modified version it would be what 65 percent i think on all your vanilla but basically that's gonna I, I'm, I'm overstating it a little bit but that's similar to taking trade deals repeatedly and again i've i've nerfed and, and changed how how research time works so don't pay attention to that and then here at level four if if the campaign goes along it probably won't but you could do it again and so what about the credit rating easy enough to buy back at that point relations with Europe, if you even care. But those level three and level four agricultural acts should, along with 50% tariffs, trade deals, trade warfare, uh, and all that other good stuff, we should be bringing in lots of, of tariff revenue. So that's what the, the next campaign is going to be about. I'm going to end this whole thing by going back and looking at what happened and kind of where we made money on trade deals because to my surprise i'm looking at tariffs but tariffs are also there in the other playthroughs a lot of the money was actually made in sales tax to my my surprise and i think that this is inaccurate i think this is wildly inaccurate and i think it, it's probably capturing some of this other stuff but i'll show you that now So, already is kind of an easy one. I, I don't intend to go through all of these. Uh, but really just weird and interesting stuff happened. And while you should be wary of average price, to my surprise, somehow the trade deals got us the cheapest already. Demand is low. I mean, it's just low. Right? The starting is just what does the campaign start with? So you kind of ignore that top line. But I wanted it to be there so people could see. Notice that with the industrial buildings, when there was much a much larger demand for it. Again, ignore production up here. I, I was a little surprised still how well trade deals did, considering I wasn't trying to build more arty. Industrial subsidy, industrial buildings kind of makes sense. This is a recurring pattern. It doesn't always hold. But with trade deals, I noticed that there tend to be more goods and markets 
there tended to be a higher trade volume. And yeah, usually there were higher tariffs and usually there was higher sales tax. Right? And, and so that's why I know that that figure I don't think is right because the figures that are in here, according to the, the game, are supposed to come from the last 12 months. And so even if that's true, as you see we, when we move through other things, th then already uh, sales alone would have been 10% of our sales tax. And so something's not being communicated one way or another correctly there. Already ammo, again, just for illustrative purposes as, as we kind of dip our toes in this, production is not terribly high with trade deals. Average price, though, is uh, almost the lowest besides industrial buildings, which cost about $200 million worth of buildings in order to get that. So what we're really getting for that, not all that much. You can see that, uh, remember, demand for already ammo is going to be affected by what's going on in, in the war. Yet again, though, the trade deals has a lot of stuff in markets. I haven't completely figured out how price works. I think it's it's probably too complicated, but it seems to be uh, some ratio of demand versus the amount in markets. And that frequently, I don't know what the ratio is, but it seems to be aligned with that. And um, well, that's that. In stock here is f uh, kind, of, kind of low, but you see trade volume is pretty high. Sales, again, it's sales tax. That's bringing in most of the money. It's not the not the tariffs so much that are doing bricks. I'm just going to show you because it basically it basically doesn't matter what you do except it was slightly higher on trade deals. I don't know what that's about. Uh, the prices weren't necessarily better. Sometimes you'll see this in other episodes or other episodes, other other slides. And again, I'm I'm going to give all this stuff away. The the link is going to be in the description, so you all can. <laughs> parse through it if, if you need to yet the, the demand for for bricks was highest in a, in a trade in the trade deal scenario i was surprised about markets was the highest sales tax again look at the competitors it, it's bringing in a lot of money in in sales taxes let's see what else is kind of notable clothing is very much used and you see here through the trade deals we double what we got with the infrastructure only and we're doing, uh, it, it's surprising, right? Here, we're doing 2.5 million. We do 3 million units there. So we do fewer units moving through, but we've collected twice the amount in sales tax. And we, we know kind of what's happening is that it's, it's coming in through the ports, it's getting a tariff, and then it's moving through IIPs, I assume on the way to markets to meet demand. That's, that's what I assume is happening. And there's just all this tax revenue. But this is, again, is why I think that sales tax figure is is wrong. Uh, maybe I didn't play, play it forward too much before I loaded this up. But <clears throat> that sales tax figure is is a big one. Coal is one that a lot of people worry about in the, in the early game. And here, it's either this one or it's the... Maybe it's over in, in iron. But we actually see like significant increases in production look industrial buildings yeah we get a lot more coal because i upgraded a lot more coal mines same thing with industrial subsidies if you're spamming you know improve uh, the efficiency of industry sure but to my surprise i didn't try anything here and and i think what's happening here is also the complement to importing a lot of in this case coal is that with trade deals it's i think not just about imports but it's also about the ability to export more Right. The, the, the amount in markets here is, is higher than it is in the industrial subsidy test. It is lower than industrial buildings. You can see that the price doesn't really matter. And so when you're, you're going absolutely bonkers to try to get you know, a lot more coal done, I understand that you do a lot of volume of it, but it's like, are you ever really going to make that money back? The initial kind of debt thing shows you, no, you're, you're probably not going to make that money back ever. Uh, so this is a very interesting one. And again, you're looking at this from the, the government's perspective which is, well, their cost stuff is, is elsewhere, but you know how much money are you getting in for this? You're getting a lot more, and trade deals are, are pretty darn cheap. What else might you care about? Um, iron, right? That's one of the other things I think folks care about. Maybe the iron ore we'll take a look at. See here, industrial buildings spent a lot of money. We got production way, way up. And, and yeah, there's a huge demand, and, and we got the prices a little bit lower per, per unit, but how much, from the government's perspective, did we take it in taxes 
not that much. How much have we taken down here? Not even trying to do it. I think we're exporting a bunch. Now, tariffs are going to be on imports. And so since we don't produce it here, we're going to have to import it. The demand, let's see. So this is one of, there's so much stuff here. One of the other things I realized is that as production grows, sometimes demand also grows. Uh, if you take an economics class, like you, you can understand why, right? As, as some prices might, might decrease, but it's not, it's not the lowest price, right? There are lower prices in, in others. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but it is, it is notable. And I, I was really kind of, I couldn't figure that, I can't figure this out, right? We have so much more in markets here. The demand is higher, uh, but just comparing it to the above example, Right, where production is lower, mountain markets is lower, and demand is lower by about, what is that, a fifth or a sixth? And, and yet the price is like markedly lower. I, I think maybe also because the industrial buildings, I built a number of things that use iron ore, <laughs> including making iron. So I don't want to belabor too many of these points, but I know that iron is one of those things that people care about uh, here. The, the pattern of trade deal usually doing the best really did not hold up. We didn't produce all that much. Demand was kind of in, in the middle, and yet the price is pretty much the same as, as elsewhere. Lead, leather, uh, machine parts is one of those valuable kind of complex things. Uh, more sales tax, I think more tariffs than anything else. So not too much surprise there. Niner is one of those things that's never really going to change that much, right? There's no K or M after these. These are all very low production numbers. We can see that demand, it does kind of change. And like it's much higher in the trade deal example. And we're bringing in quite a bit more uh, on infrastructure. Right? We're, we're seeing certainly the, the money is coming in in forms of tariffs. But then we notice in the trade deals, kind of conversely to what I would assume, I would think that we'd get more in sales tax from more in, uh, efficient infrastructure. But we actually get more sales tax and more goods moving through IIPs. And so that might also, well, we just don't produce that much. So it doesn't, it doesn't really explain. It. it must be that the imports are traveling through IIPs and that, that, that those taxes are being collected there. Provisions, maybe one of the, the, the biggest costs are the ones that certainly I'm paying more attention to. And just look at that monster amount of money. Right? The, the agricultural subsidies, which was my second best overall test, uh, you know, that one uh, is about half. And even though it looks like we imported more in the 12 months prior to this test, uh, we more than made up for that in the, the, the sales taxes. And All right, that's that. Uh, steel is kind of cool. If only it would show up. But yet again, kind of big money brought in there. Not not as astounding there, but uh, blah blah blah. Transport ships. I think this one was weird. Let me see. I think it was weird because it gave me a, a higher production value than I assumed would come elsewhere. We had a much higher production value under the agricultural building test, which is just again kind of weird. You can see. Look at how much they cost when this thing started. And there is somewhat significant variation in, in final product prices, but the demand is so low that I don't think most people ever, ever really notice it. But yet again, it's one of those things that, that trade deals brought in the most money, and they did it not through tariffs, but through sales tax. Uh, I, whatever. I think there's still something off in, in the data. Maybe maybe things are like switching columns because I brought in way more in tariffs, yet when you actually look at what's showing up in those columns, it looks it makes it look like the sales tax is the, the, the largest part. So that is all for now. Uh, this is a, a work in progress test and uh, the next campaign is going to go up and then hopefully we'll have a chance to test some of these uh, going forward, but the next one is going to be kind of this sweaty playthrough, uh, which is going to play out like I talked about earlier in this this video, where I think I'm going to end up eventually going for all different uh, 
policy categories and, and sub, probably maxing out subsidies in all areas and, and probably spamming one or two projects at most. I guess that's a good sign to, to end things here if the internet's going down. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we'll report on that. And then uh, once I come out the other end of that campaign, maybe uh, maybe test some of these other to see what the interactions are. By taking industrialization, the infrastructure only doesn't really matter unless you're going to build markets and then take the market reform. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe try that one out. Uh, I think I'd be less inclined to do industrial buildings because I think infrastructure as a policy is going to give me a number of the things that I had to pay for when it came to industrial buildings anyways. And uh, yeah, one of the tests, one of the things I would expect to change from this last playthrough is that with the tax, the revenue generating acts uh, certainly being selected and maxed out, I would expect to take on a lot more debt. But as I learned from this test, you have to actually test these assumptions to see what you get. For those of you who stuck here to the end, and even if you tapped out long before, you won't hear this, but I hope this did help, and uh, I'll provide updates as I have them.